Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to our Monday talk, uh, the week of Thanksgiving. It's actually great to see so many people here. Um, uh, hopefully there'll be people joining in as I was telling my guys, there's people taking off for the week um, because of the holidays, but thanks for coming. Uh, we're really happy to welcome you to Boston University and to the Center for Brain Recovery. Uh, Dr. Sango has a PhD from the German Center of Neurodegenerative Diseases, did a postdoc at UCLA, and just started at Bill this fall. You're holding up okay so far? I haven't even started officially, so that's, that's right. in January, so I'm, uh, I'm, That's I'm, right. I'm, okay, so you're settling in. Yeah. Um, he's already received several awards, including the NIH Pathway to Independence Award, the K99R00 um, from NINDS. Uh, the 2021 UCLA Chancellor's Award for Postdoctoral Research, and a 2023 Sir Mac Corkin Postdoctoral Award for the Memory Disorders Research Society. Um, and the reason you are here today is because you're interested in how the brain supports central and critical cognitive and behavioral functions, something that the Center for Brain Recovery cares a lot, a lot about. Um, Please right here. Um, and, and particularly in terms of spatial navigation and memory and the neural mechanisms that underlie age-related impairments and these functions. This is exactly what we're very interested in at the Center for Brain Recovery. And your approaches include deep brain stimulation, I'm sorry, deep brain recordings. Um, you said electrocortical recordings, as well as free people in naturalistic environments, something that we're also very excited about. Um, so thank you for taking the time to come talk to us today. We're really excited about your presentation, and we'll just give you a quick warm welcome um, in case people have to leave at 4 o'clock. Yeah. And the way this works is that everybody can hear the questions towards the end, so feel free to go to your whole talk, and then we'll take in-person question and online questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. And I'm assuming the Zoom folks can hear me all right. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Okay. yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you for this um, uh, wonderful introduction. I'm really very excited to be here. And um, yeah, as um, you've already said, I'm postdoc at UCLA um, and very excited to actually start here at BU in just a couple of weeks um, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and very happy to tell you more today about um, a line of research that I have been pursuing at um, as a postdoc at UCLA, but that I will also um, continue to um, follow here at BU in my in my new lab. And um, so the main focus um, of the presentation today will be on mobile cognition and actually how we can bring cognitive neuroscience and neuromodulation from the laboratory out there into the real world and into our everyday life. Okay. Something's not working. Okay, here we are. Um, one of the aims of cognitive neuroscience, and I would argue it's a really important aim of cognitive neuroscience is, first of all, to understand the fundamental mechanisms of human cognition, but to do that not only in healthy individuals, but also as a kind of a next step to identify markers, causes, sources of malfunctions in the underlying neural systems. Um, for example, in the course of um, psychiatric or neurological um, diseases. And so that and, uh, then as a next step, and I would argue only if we have a solid understanding of the fundamental mechanisms of cognition, and if we can identify the sources of malfunction, then we can also think about identifying targets and developing neuromodulation treatments for affected, affected individuals. But um, one important point to add here, I think, is that our goal is really to understand the neural basis of cognitive dysfunctions and functions in everyday life, and that we want to develop treatments that are effective in everyday life, not just in the laboratory, not just in the hospital and in the clinic, right? And so I want to show you a few short video clips just to remind us all of um, how dynamic, how 
active our everyday life actually is and how dynamic and, and flexible our cognitive functions and our behavior have to be. So when we, for example, just navigate through the city, um, we first of all need to physically move through the environment and we have to coordinate our movements with all kinds of cognitive processes, such as keeping track of where we are or also keeping track of where other people are. We don't want to bump into them. We don't want to bump into a car or a tram or something like that, right? Um, similarly, when we go hiking, for example, we process tons of sensory information while we're physically moving. We don't want to fall. We don't want to get lost. Um, we have to coordinate our movements with lots of cognitive functions or when we play tennis or any other sports, really, um, or when we just walk into a restaurant. These are all very active, very cognitively demanding tasks um, where we coordinate our physical movement through the environment with interactions, with interactions with other individuals, interactions with the environment. And these are all, also all processes where, for example, we can form memories of our experience, right? Now, when we want to study how the human brain allows us to do all these kinds of things, we have a substantial problem that I'd like to mention here. Um, and this is that Traditional neuroimaging methods such as fMRI or MEG, just as examples, they do not allow us to record brain activity in these um, active, in these dynamic, natural um, situations. Instead, they require us to remain motionless and in not so naturalistic situations, right? Um, I want to say this very clearly that um, I use fMRI, for example, and I have used fMRI and I will use fMRI myself. And I have no doubt um, that um, we can do many, many wonderful things and can get very important insights with these traditional methods. But I think we also have to ask the question whether and to what extent our findings from these studies then translate into the real world to active, to dynamic, complex and rich everyday life situations. And now we really have new opportunities, new methods and technologies to study the human brain in everyday life and in real world situations. Um, one, for example, is um, MEG that I've just mentioned before, where now new generations of so-called OPM, um, optically pumped magnetometer, um, MEG systems really allow people while being, um, while their brain um, is recorded and scanned, um, they can move around. This is still somewhat limited to magnetically shielded rooms, but still we can already record human brain activity in freely moving people with um, new generations of MEG systems. Um, we have mobile scalp um, EEG recording systems, which are miniaturized and fit into a backpack so people can go outdoors or can freely move around in rooms. We have um, methods to clean the data from uh, movement artifacts, pretty, pretty um, solid methods, I would say. So this is another really great opportunity. Or um, David Boas, who is here today, I was uh, prepared to say just across the street, they, um, David Boas and his lab um, develop really amazing mobile high density FNIR systems, which most certainly allow us to um, study human brain activity and cortical contributions to cognition in everyday life situations, indoors, outdoors, during all kinds of day to day tasks. Um, now, all of these methods that I've shown so far, um, they are non-invasive, which is obviously a really um, uh, a good thing. Um, at the same time, these methods are not um, typically able to record from deep brain regions, um, whereas like deep brain regions such as the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, medial temporal lobe, we know that they are also uh, important for a broad range of cognitive functions. Um, so another method that I want to show here is a method that actually allows us to record from regions like the hippocampus or medial temporal lobe, um, also in everyday life situations. And this is possible because there is quite a large number of people in the U.S. now who have so-called closed loop neuromodulation systems chronically implanted into their brains. Um, so this system or these systems um, are implanted permanently, chronically over years and decades in these people's brains. And what's happening there is they're typically implanted for the treatment of epilepsy, in some cases for Parkinson's or other diseases as well. And they have um, deep brain electrodes. So these electrodes, again, permanently implanted into brain regions such as the hippocampus, such as medial temporal lobe regions, deep brain regions that we cannot really record from otherwise. 
And these people live completely normal day-to-day -day lives. These um, systems are completely shielded and implanted into their brains. Um, so if we can get access to these um, signals, then we can again record from the human brain in real life, um, in everyday life um, situations. So for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna focus on these closed loop neuromodulation systems and recordings from deep brain devices, because that was my main focus really um, in the Sutana lab at UCLA during my postdoc. Um, so a few words about this from a technical perspective. Um, these systems have not been developed for research. So that makes it actually really challenging to get access to these signals while people are doing daily life tasks, right? So that's why we um, worked really hard over the last couple of years in the Sutana lab and we were able to um, develop a system to get a direct readout of these signals that are recorded from deep brain regions, um, oscillatory intracranial EEG signals from um, these deep brain electrodes. And when we do this and when we want to run studies with um, participants who have these implanted devices, we can also synchronize this. We use tons of other technologies, variable technologies. For example, we want to uh, measure these people's behavior um, through, for example, motion tracking systems. And we want to capture environmental influences through um, audio video recordings. For example, we can combine this with virtual reality, augmented reality devices, mobile eye tracking, and all kinds of other physiological parameters, heart rate, skin conductance, respiration, and so on. Whatever we're interested in for um, a specific study. Now, coming back to these important aims of cognitive neuroscience, where I think um, at the basis is this fundamental understanding of human cognition and then going all the way to um, developing um, neuromodulation treatments. My main point that I'm trying to make today is that mobile neuroimaging methods, neuroimaging in everyday life and in the real world situations can provide invaluable insights into all of these areas. So if you just believe me, we could technically stop here, but I thought it might be a good idea to like show you a couple of examples why this is actually the case. And I'm trying to, to convince you with that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for the next or for the first part of the presentation, I really want to focus on these kind of fundamental mechanisms of human cognition, the um, these basic cognitive neuroscience questions. And Obviously, cognition yeah, and human behavior yeah. are like really, really broad topics. Oh, so my but personal that's that's research that. focus is on specific cognitive functions and that all kind of is mainly focusing around spatial cognition, spatial navigation and memory, trying to answer questions or address questions such as how do we keep track of where we are while we, while we navigate through our environment in everyday life? How does our brain represent the environment we are in? And how do we form memories during everyday life experiences? And I also want to say a few words why I think these are really, really important questions. So first of all, um, these are all cognitive functions that we need and that we do and use countless times, basically continuously throughout our everyday life. At the same time, we do not know much about how the brain really allows us to do these things. Also, we know that these are all functions that are strongly, disproportionately strongly affected, for example, in the course of healthy aging, but in particular also in the course of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's in particular or uh, dementias. So again, I think we really need to study these um, things, answer these questions be before we can really think about um, developing effective treatment options for affected in uh, individuals. Especially when it comes to spatial navigation and memory, we do know that the brain supports um, these cognitive functions by forming neural representations of space of the environment. Um, but it is, I think, fair to say that a lot of what we know about this also stems from research in non-human animals, where, for example, a rat, a rat or a mouse is running around in an environment and we record brain activity from, um, from this animal. And um, we see that, for example, on the level of single neurons, again, typically in the medial temporal lobe in regions such as the hippocampus, we see that there is a broad variety of cell types, individual single neuron types, which form representations of 
um, spatial information, spatial representations. And a very prominent example that I want to show here is um, called a grid cell. What a grid cell does is while the animal is running around, it fires at particular locations and multiple locations in the environment. Um, and these locations form like a, a regular, um, very symmetric, regular pattern that spans the whole environment. And this is thought to really give us kind of an internal sense of a coordinate system, like a brain's GPS, um, from which we can then derive all kinds of information. Information, for example, about where we are, um, our movement direction, our movement speed, these kinds of things, right? Um, there are tons of other spatially tuned cell types, but it's important to also mention that we see these spatial representations not only on the level of single neurons, but also on the level of oscillations, deep brain oscillations, especially also in medial temporal lobe or hippocampal regions. There is one type of oscillation that is also very prominent. That's called the so-called theta oscillation, a low frequency component about around eight hertz and a very um, typical finding that we see in uh, rodents during navigation is oscillations show higher power, higher amplitudes for faster as compared to slower movement speeds um, while these animals are running around through the environment. Uh, when we want to study these kinds of things in humans, we have a pretty substantial problem. Again, if our um, participants cannot move, right? So that is, this is why um, we work uh, with people who have these chronically implanted deep brain recording and stimulation devices um, where we can study these things in um, while our participants are moving. Let's see. Um, so shown here in this video is actually an example. So this is a real patient that we um, were working with, um, walking around in our experimental room. And you can see on the bottom right um, that we record intracranial EEG, so oscillatory brain activity from this person's medial temporal lobe um, and hippocampus in particular. And we combine these data also with motion tracking information shown here on the bottom left and with, um, in this case, mobile eye tracking shown on the on the top right one of the first questions that um, we were interested in in such a study is do we see these theta oscillations that are so prominent in rodents during navigation the short answer is yes we do see beautiful theta oscillations in the medial temporal lobe of freely moving humans um, but also we see that these theta oscillations um, behave a little bit differently than what we are used to see in rodents, because in rodents, when they're navigating, um, these theta oscillations are really continuous. Um, in humans, that's not the case. In humans, typically what we see is that these theta oscillations are absent for most of the time, but they come and go in short bouts where we see these theta oscillations about, of about typically a second length around maybe 20% of the time. But nevertheless, um, these theta bouts or theta oscillations, we see that they still contain this code for movement speed, where we see um, that when people move at faster speeds, we see either higher prevalence of bouts or again, higher power, higher amplitudes of theta oscillations, again, which we think gives us like an, a kind of a neural signature for our movement speed as we move through the environment. We do also see that theta oscillations do not only contain information about our speed, but also about our location in the environment. So while our participants are moving around, one thing that we noticed is that um, theta oscillations were significantly clearly stronger whenever the person was near one of the boundaries of the environment as compared to the inner areas of the room, um, which um, obviously, we thought gives us a sense of our self-location, where we are in this environment based to kind of orientation cues that we have available, which in this case, in this case are um, the walls of this room. So we asked our participants to perform another task as well, where now um, people were sitting in the corner of the room while we were recording again from their um, uh, medial temporal lobe regions um, and these people were now not moving but they were watching somebody else and this other person was walking around um, in the room 
And what we see is pretty much the same picture. We see now, even though um, our participants were not moving at all, they were sitting in the corner of the room, their um, brain oscillations were modulated by the other person's location in the room. Um, so again, pretty much the same picture. When the other person was near one of the environmental boundaries, the participant theta oscillations showed higher power as compared to when the other person was in the inner areas of the room, which we interpret in a way as um, we kind of have a code for where we are, but we can use the same neural mechanisms also to keep track of the location of other people in our environment, for example, in social situations. Um, another representation type that we are really interested in is um, the representation that is formed by these grid cells, this cell type that I have mentioned earlier, which kind of is firing at multiple locations in the environment and is thought to give us something like an internal um, coordinate system. Um, in these data, we cannot uh, look at single neuron activity. These are deep brain oscillations that we're recording here. But there is a method, a mathematical method, um, to look at the activity of grid cell population. So on the level of oscillatory activity, we can look at um, grid cell uh, population activity. Um, it's quite a kind of it's not a straightforward mathematical method, so I'm just going to give you a quick overview to um, to give you an idea of how this works. Um, what you can do is you can draw these kind of main axes through um, these uh, through a prototypical grid cells firing pattern, and we can also um, look at the behavior of our participants and. Um, categorize each of the participants movements into whether this movement was more aligned or misaligned with one of the um, grids axes. Um, and then what we expect to see from a population of grid cells is we expect to see that um, oscillatory power from a grid cell population kind of gives us this sinusoidal shape, sinusoidal um, pattern of with higher oscillatory power whenever the person is moving aligned versus misaligned with one of these grid axes. So whenever we um, see that, we can be pretty confident that we're recording from grid cell populations actually. And long story short, um, what I'm showing here is data from one um, example participant and one recording channel in the enteron cortex, which is exactly where uh, lots of grid cells are usually um, located. And we see that um, these that theta power shows this beautiful sinusoidal modulation where theta power is going up and down as a function of this person's movement direction. But um, most exciting is that the same recording channel shows this um, sinusoidal modulation not only when the person is moving around, but also when the person is sitting in the corner and watching somebody else who is moving around in the room. So we interpret this in a way that we kind of form this um, internal coordinate system through grid cells and grid cell-like representations to keep track of where we are and where we move. But we can basically also put other people in our environment in this same coordinate system. We use the same neural mechanism, the same internal coordinate system also to keep track of where other people are in our environment. Oh, and um, so this was only an example participant, an example channel, but we see the same pattern um, for um, aligned versus misaligned movements um, that basically indicates grid cell activity in five out of five participants who we tested with this um, with this task. Um, we see this in every single participant, at least in one recording channel, we see the significant effect. So we're pretty confident that this um, tells us that grid cells or grid cell-like representations actually um, encode not only self-movement, self-location, but also location and movements of others. Um, one um, other data set that I wanted to show you here is um, data from people who are actually not moving, um, but these are people who are in the hospital. Um, they have multiple electrodes implanted for epilepsy monitoring. So in very severe cases of epilepsy, sometimes people are in the hospital for about two weeks and get lots of electrodes implanted. So um, 
so so the clinical team can determine seizure onset zones and and further treatment options and in some cases we can actually use um, specific types of electrodes like the one shown here called banky freed electrode which has a little micro wires at the tip from which we can record the activity of single individual human neurons while um, these patients can do our experimental tasks and so what we did um, is we asked participants to wear a head-mounted display, an immersive um, head-mounted display. And in this display, these people would see a video, um, a video that was recorded um, in our experimental room and showing another person walking around in this room. We did this with a very special technique with a 360 degree video camera. Long story short, it gives them like, if you show such a video in the head mounted display, it gives you a very immersive feeling. So you can actually move your head and look around. It's almost like you're part of that scene. If it, like if you're actually sitting in that room. And um, what we see is um, we see actually um, in every person, we see a handful of cells that show exactly this beautiful grid cell-like pattern. But these grid cells are now, or the firing fields of these grid cells are now determined by this other person's location who is walking around in this kind of video, um, which again, we find that very exciting because previously the grid, uh, the, the, the field um, really thought that grid cells are supposed to um, encode self motion information. But now even on a single cell level, um, we see pretty strong um, accumulating evidence that grid cells allow us to keep track not only of where we are, but again, um, form the neural substrate to keep track of where other people <clears throat> and potentially also objects like cars or whatever really are in the environment. Um, so far, there is really no report to my knowledge um, of recording single neuron activity in the human brain of freely moving humans. Um, so I wanted to show you a very recent technical development, also something that we have developed in the Sutana lab in collaboration with engineering labs at UCLA, which is called the NeuroStack. Uh, so this is a hardware and uh, combined also with software solutions that we have developed there, which um, the beauty here is um, this is a recording system that allows us to record from intracranially implanted electrodes and not only oscillatory activity, but also these little micro electrodes uh, that allow us to really look at um, single neuron activity um, with a system that is small enough to actually fit in a backpack. Um, so we can now really, and we have asked our participants in the, or the patients in this epilepsy monitoring unit to walk around, which really allowed us for the first time, um, to my knowledge, um, record from single neurons in the human brain um, of freely moving people. Um, this is, it's already published, but it's prototype level. So unfortunately I can't like show you lots of data from actual studies we've done with this, but I think it's just a really exciting development because down the line, um, this will really give us a, a really amazing opportunity to even look at the single neuron level um, in freely moving people who are just walking around in the real world really. Another tool that I have not mentioned um, much yet is um, virtual reality. So obviously this is not the real world, but still it gives us um, really great opportunities to study the human brain um, of freely moving people, right? So what we do is we combine virtual reality technologies such as these head mounted displays um, with motion tracking technologies. Um, and what this does or what the advantages of this is with virtual reality, we can really design the experimental environments um, and study situations that we um, want to that we want to have. We can have objects appearing, disappearing, whatever we really want to do. So we have complete control over the experimental environment, but still we combine this with motion tracking so we can have people freely moving around in um, in the physical room and we kind of translate their movements so that they so into what they see and into the virtual environment so they can actually really walk around in a virtual world so to say and another study that i wanted to show you which was published actually just a couple of weeks ago um, is where we used virtual reality to look closer at this kind of intersection between navigation and memory 
Um, what we did is we designed a virtual room, which looks like a little bit like an art gallery, um, um, where from top down perspective, you can see there are these little colored translucent cylinders, we call them halos in the room. And what um, actually we designed two rooms which were very similar, but they had different like color schemes and different halo locations in these rooms. And people were, uh, our participants were jumping back and forth between these two different rooms. And first they under, they, they went through like an encoding period where the task for them was to really learn the locations of these cylinders, um, of these halos in the room. You can see an example here. That's not an actual participant. That's an experiment that's just demoing the whole thing. But you can see that we ask participants in virtual reality to um, physically walk to the location of these halos. But also um, these trials were intermixed with other trials where we asked them to just go to a visible thing um, where they didn't have to learn anything. They just went to like one of these arrows and we tracked their um, movements while they did that. And once everybody had learned um, the locations of these halos, um, they moved on to a next stage, which was the retrieval kind of um, period where now all the um, halos disappeared. That's what we did just in our virtual environment, right? Um, and we asked them now, please go back to the location of, for example, the yellow halo. So they had to do this from memory, right? Right, can I ask one question? Yeah. So the training is happening in VR, but the actual testing is happening in person no it's um it's all in vr okay. so it's all so they were always in this environment that you can see here on like the vr view mm -hmm. it, the only difference was really that during Stuff training away. yeah and during training they would see these cylinders um these halos um so they could learn it and once they arrived there it would disappear the next would pop up and during um during the retrieval they were in the same um in the same environment but they just got an instruction now please go to um based on your memory go back to the location of this halo but this was still in the same environment but they were jumping back and forth between two different virtual environments but this was basically to make the task more difficult but it, they were always in the in the virtual yeah. virtual world okay um all right um First, what we see, and that's basically a replication of what I've shown you earlier, we see again that these deep brain um, oscillations, theta um, oscillations in particular, were modulated by spatial features, um, environmental features, um, like, for example, the boundaries of the room. That's um, what I've shown you before. But what's interesting here is we see this signal only um, during periods when there was no memory demand. This was when people were just walking towards these visible things, like the arrows that were shown that they did not have to use their memory to remember um, any location. But we also see um, that during the periods when we asked them to find these locations um, of halos, where basically they had to use their memory to go back to these locations that they had learned before, the brain seems to switch to different types of representations, where now um, theta oscillations are modulated by proximity to these locations of these halos. So it seems um, that the brain is really switching between different representation types based on task demands, and what's also interesting is that we see this effect only during correct retrieval of locations, not when people um, showed incorrect attempts. So I guess the two takeaways that, that we have here is, first of all, that increased data power um, seems to be something like a signature of successful memory recall. And the other important thing is we see that um, the human brain seems to be able to really dynamically and flexibly switch between different um, types of representations um, depending on current um, task demands. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, at this point, I'd like to switch gears um, because I promised you earlier that I would not only focus on these fundamental mechanisms of cognition, but also um, tell you more about how we think we can and we will bring um, this kind of fundamental knowledge um, all the way to development and identifying targets for neuromodulation treatment and really develop um, effective treatment options and how we think mobile neuroimaging can help us with that. Um, again, what we want is we want 
treatment options that are successful in everyday life, not just in the clinic, not just in the laboratory, right? Um, but again, we have the same problem that I've mentioned before. Um, most of our knowledge actually about these fundamental mechanisms um, stems from laboratory-based studies, which comes at the risk, the risk that our knowledge may or may not translate to everyday life in real-world situations. And that also means that our treatments might not be as effective as we want them to be. But again, here, I think um, mobile neuroimaging is really a beautiful tool that allows us um, to address these problems because now we are able to perform ecologically valid studies and get um, insights into a really broad range of cognitive functions and processes in the real world, in everyday life situations. And me memory navigation are just two examples of cognitive processes that we can look at. We can look at many, many more things like movement, um, social interactions, for example, or the neural basis of emotion. And many of these questions are actually really hard to study or to address in the laboratory. Just think about um, depression, for example, um, emotion, where uh, many of these are really hard to trigger in the laboratory. Or when you think about all the different cycles of a depressive person, it's hard to capture all of that since this happens over very long time periods, over a month, right? Um, but still, the better we um, are able to understand the neural basis of these cognitive processes, the better we will be able to um, treat the um, associated conditions like neurological or psychiatric diseases, and, and there is a long list of um, a long list of disorders and diseases that um, are connected with these cognitive functions. Studies from Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, depression, PTSD, um, many, many more. And the hope is that um, with mobile neuroimaging methods with um, recordings in the real world, we will be able to identify ecologically valid biomarkers of these conditions, which are then more likely to translate to everyday life in the real world, and which also help us to develop something like personalized um, biomarkers, which are um, valid not only for, for example, a group of depressive pe uh, people, but really personalized, individualized to a specific person's um, needs and condition. And in the long term, the hope is that this will lead to more effective um, and efficient neuromodulation treatment, for example, through long term closed loop DBS treatments, which also have other advantages, um, such as we can monitor treatment response long term. And if needed, we can again adjust treatment parameters, for example, again, based on an individual person's condition and um, needs. And one study that I want to show you here, because I think it's a great example for how we can um, do all of that, is a study that we have done in the Sutana lab <clears throat> over the last couple of years, was also published um, this year, which now has nothing to do with navigation and um, not much with memory either. Um, but again, it's, a, I think, a really great example for how we can use these new uh, methods, new technologies to really um, actually go all the way from um, understanding fundamental mechanisms of cognition to um, actually helping affected individuals. And this study is focusing on a condition um, that, that's like treatment resistant post-traumatic stress disorders uh, disorder. And this is part of a clinical trial. Um, so this was a study from the Sutana lab in collaboration with the Veterans Administration um, in LA, where we carried out a clinical trial. Um, so far, we have two people complete, who have completed this trial. These are combat veterans, war veterans um, who have um, treatment resistant post traumatic stress disorder. Um, they have undergone many treatment um, options um, which were not successful. So, um, what happened is they also got these um, systems implanted into their brains. Um, these, um, in this case, the Neuropace RNS system, which again is able to record and stimulate. Um, as I've explained before, and these people have um, implanted um, neuropace RNS systems with bilateral electrodes in basolateral amygdala, which is known to be um, associated with PTSD symptoms. And the mm -hmm. idea here is that um, 
PTSD patients, these war veterans might experience something in their everyday life um, that kind of reminds them of um, a traumatic experience or puts them in kind of a, or gives them something like a, a flashback and puts them in um, a fear state. Just for example, think about New Year's Eve and they might see or hear a fireworks, which reminds them of a war situation or something like that. And this um, is thought to like put them back into a fear state. Um, and so the hope is that we can um, measure and kind of um, recognize this fear state um, through our uh, implanted electrodes. And um, if the device um, recognizes this fear state, then uh, we can stimulate and use electric stimulation of the amygdala to put them back in an extinction state um, where um, they show um, lower symptom severity. Um, so first of all, what we need is kind of a, a biomarker or a neural signature of this fear state in PTSD. Um, so we started off with a lab-based approach where we showed um, our two war veterans a series of images, positive, neutral, negative images. And what we see is that for negative images compared to all other images, we see that they actually show a strong response in the amygdala, um, increased theta power around one second after image presentation. So that's also shown by this bar graph here. But at this point, we don't know if that's just a normal response that everybody would show or if this is um, specific to PTSD. So we did the same test also in people who had electrodes implanted in the amygdala for different reasons. This was, again, a group of people who underwent um, epilepsy monitoring. Um, and here we see that this response, this strong response in the amygdala, uh, was really specific to um, our PTSD patients and did not show up in, um, oh. in other um, people. But we also wanted to um, see this not only in the lab, we wanted to really see if we can find the same effect also in everyday life. So what we did is we asked our um, participants basically to let us know when something happened in their daily life. Um, so they were at home doing all kinds of things. And whenever they kind of experienced something like a flashback situation, we asked them to let us know. Um, and um, so we could zoom into these time periods more closely. And then post hoc, um, we asked them to give us a little description of what actually happened. And so in one case, this was actually like what I mentioned before, it was actually fireworks around the neighborhood, which put them into like hypervigilant racy feeling. And this went all the way in some cases to suicidal thoughts. Again, these were like very severely, uh, very severe cases. Um, and again, what we see um, is when people reported um, in their everyday day-to-day -day life, um, when they reported these kind of flashback situations, we see this increased um, amygdala activity um, during these flashback situations um, as compared to what we call here scheduled recordings, which are basically um, record like time periods when nothing extraordinary happened. Um, this is just a little side note that I want to show here is one thing that we see, which is interesting um, in the real world, um, we see that this effect is really mainly driven or almost exclusively driven by the right hemisphere, the right amygdala, not the left one, which is interesting because this hemispheric difference is something that we really only see in our real world recordings. This is not something that we see in the lab um, data, which may point us towards like a difference between everyday life real world situations and the lab but obviously also we don't want to over interpret this these are two um two individuals so um, we obviously need more data to to confirm that but anyways at this point we uh, felt like we have a pretty robust marker um, that kind of is present in the lab in the real world a marker of this kind of ptsd fear state um, that we then wanted to use for closed loop neuro um, stimulation so basically whenever um, this heightened amygdala activity was detected by the system um, the system delivered or was programmed to deliver um, electrical stimulation to the amygdala and what's shown here is um, the orange curve shows um, basically the amount of stimulation pulses that was delivered um, in this case over a 12 month time period. Um, and the gray curve shows the symptom severity um, of this person. And 
what's really an amazing result i think is we can see that when one stimulation was turned on and stimulation was increasing over time um, we see that also symptom severity of this person um, well remember that nothing else really helped this person right uh, but then we can see that um, symptom severity really went down and this person is now in remission state so really um in terms of PTSD symptoms, um, not um, we're not able to distinguish this from a healthy person. Um, our second um, war veteran um, shows a similar picture, but um, not as obvious, not as strong. But again, we see when um, stimulation was turned on and goes up over time, symptoms um, go down. I can tell you anecdotally, unfortunately, I cannot show you this, but I can tell you anecdotally. So this is this. Um, so these 12 months were um, the duration of the clinical trial, but we are now um, at 24 months and we're still in contact with them. And we even also um, measure symptom severity um, repeatedly. And also this person is now almost at remission stage. So it seems that it was more like a delayed and slower response, but also this second person is doing um, very, very well or much better um, than at the beginning. So from that, we um, think we can conclude that we were able to identify a really robust neural signature of the PTSD fear state, both in the laboratory and in the real world, and um, that we can use this neural signature to trigger closed loop deep brain stimulation, which then really helps us um, or helps these patients and we can really significantly improve um, their symptom severity. Um, mm -hmm. With that, I just want to end by saying a few words about like future directions. Um, it is really my strong belief that we will get the best understanding of human cognition, of human behavior, if we do not only focus on one um, imaging or research modality. I do not think that mobile neuroimaging methods will explain everything. I really believe that um, we have the best chance of understanding and getting a comprehensive understanding of cognition and behavior if we combine everything we have, right? If we use a multimodal neuroimaging approach where theories, laboratory-based studies, and real-world studies um, are carried out and inform each other, where we use invasive and non-invasive neuroimaging modalities combined with recordings of behavior, where we do mobile and stationary neuroimaging studies. So we can really get a good understanding of human cognition all the way from single neurons to population and network dynamics. Um, and an important point for me personally is also, I think this always requires really advanced engineering and data analysis solutions, which we have developed, which we obviously will need to continue to develop um, in the future so that um, eventually, we're hopefully able to address and answer key questions of cognitive neuroscience and um, clinical applications, question, questions related to cognitive um, cognition and behavior in natural, in dynamic, in um, active, real world and everyday life situations. Um, and so we hopefully will be able to identify behavioral and neurophysiological markers of pathological processes and identify structural and functional targets for neuromodulation treatment options. Um, I also want to do a little bit of self-advertisement. Um, so um, what I've shown on the last slide is not only what I think and what I would like to see for the um, kind of cognitive neuroscience field um, uh, for the future. Um, this is also the line of research that I want to pursue in my own lab here at BU. Um, and so if you're interested in this line of research, if you know of any people or students who are interested in this, or if you're interested in a collaboration, I would love to hear from you. We have open positions pretty much at all levels um, in the new lab. So um, please let me know if um, this is something that you um, are excited about. And with that, I would like to thank everybody who contributed to this work, which is a long uh, list of people, first of all, really amazing group uh, of people in Nantia Sutana's lab at UCLA, a long list of um, fantastic collaborators. Um, we're obviously very grateful for funding from the NIH for this type of work. And I can't overemphasize enough that we're like really very grateful for every single person who has participated in these studies, because obviously none of this would have been possible without their um without their contribution um and i would like to thank you very much for your attention
That was fascinating. I thought there were lots of questions. Let's try to do a few in the room and then uh, Charlotte will keep track of the questions in the audience. They are online. Let's go first. Thank you for the great talk. So I'm curious about the neural stack that you've developed. Uh, I was wondering, like, has it been confirmed that the recording from the recording is like always from the same goal, the same single cell, or like has it been confirmed? So you mean basically if you record over a long time period, if you can tell that you're recording from the same cell over time, or is that is that the question? Yeah. That's a good question. So first of all, uh, so these electrodes that are implanted, um, so what we have um, looked at so far, uh, people in the hospital, um, they have um, electrodes implanted for up to two weeks. And so um, this is not something that I personally would call like a very stable setup. So um, something happens, for example, during sleep, something might move a little bit. So it's actually a really valid point and it's not, um, I think, it hasn't been confirmed. And I think it's more like the other way around. It's like we're pretty certain that um, you're losing a lot of units, you're using a lot of cells like over time. So there are, for example, research groups um, I know are saying, okay, you can get a decent signal of a single neuron in the first basically couple of days after the implant, um, and then you lose more and more units over time. And then after two weeks, you're pretty much recording noise. So I think it's very, very hard um, to kind of have a long-term recording of the same cell, um, which would be very interesting for, um, for many studies, but I think this also needs more development. Um, technically, you, I'm not saying you can 100% confirm your recording from the same cell, but um, you can, for example, most cells um, have different waveforms. So you can look at um, you can look at the waveform that you record. Um, and so if you have um, a signal at one of these little microwires, right? Um, and you can see that the waveform is the same on day one and day two in about the same region, you can assume that um, this is probably from the same cell. So you can use techniques like that, like, like uh, the waveform, um, look at the waveform of cells to confirm if it's the same cell or not. But also these are, you know, like more estimates than, than like 100% perfect, um, perfect uh, confirmation methods. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. I was struck by that slide where you showed your five participants and you said as long as you're getting it from at least one set of recordings. And so my question actually is sort of similar in that does it matter where you're recording from? Because it sounds like you're really just looking at theta big amplitude. So maybe it doesn't matter where the recordings are. It's mostly the you know sort of more higher level spectral data that's more interesting. Um, Maybe that's a nice question, but that's sort of what I was thinking. I think it does matter. Um, so the thing is the most of the questions that I'm interested in really related to um, navigation and memory. It just happens to be the case that the hippocampus, the entrinal cortex, these are the brain regions that um, are usually recorded from. So we're looking at these regions. So basically, we really invite people who have electrode contacts exactly at these regions. Um, in the study that I've shown also, um, where we're looking at memory and navigation um, representations, um, we also see that these same things do not happen in non-medial temporal lobe regions. So there is some specificity to it. But um, the thing is, we are working with patients who, you know, like, have electrodes implanted or can have electrodes implanted all over the all over the place, but we specifically are interested in um, cognitive processes that are like or, or, or neural signatures that are happening in the hippocampus in the entrinal cortex. So we really invite people specifically who have electrodes so there. In that graph you show with the five participants, it's all about region of interest analysis. It doesn't matter specifically which set of neurons it is, but it's all related to spatial navigation. Yes. That and you will get the same, assuming you had 100 participants, you'll get the same results across those, those regions. I, I would assume um, that it depends a lot on the region. Um, we see, so what I've shown, uh, so this, um, 
the slide that you're mentioning with the five participants, we do see um, this not on every recording channel. We see at least one recording channel per participant um, where we see this effect. And this is interestingly really, um, these are, I don't want to say always, but these are usually the regions, uh, the brain regions that are either in the anteron cortex or in the subiculum or very close to it, um, where we can assume it picks up signals from these brain regions. So I do not think um, that this signal um, is something that you can detect like everywhere in the brain. There is a study which um, looks at this in virtual reality in people who are not moving and so on, um, where the they do find um, these kind of this uh, sinusoidal modulation, like this grid cell signature, also in other brain regions. Um, but it seems to be strongest in the anteron cortex. It seems to be strong in the subiculum. Um, but that's also something that I find very interesting because we are already, and I do this myself, we are really like looking at these regions in particular. We're inviting people who have electrodes there because this is where we expect the signal to be. But I think this is also kind of a biased approach because we're looking there because that's where all the rodent studies or non-human primate studies are telling us we should look and this is where grid cells are. But again, um, there are studies in humans showing that it's more widespread. It seems to be more like a grid cell network, even like there are recordings um, in like frontal brain areas, parietal brain areas. So it seems to be more widespread. But um, again, we see um, that the signal I don't want to say it's exclusively, but it's at least most str it's strongest um, in the areas where we would expect it where we would expect it to be, which I think the the core is like um, anteron cortex and subiculum. Yes, yes. In the data you show are these single events or are they repetitions of any event? Um, so. Depends. I mean, basically, for all the studies, um, we get a lot of data, so it's always repetitions. Yes, um, which is kind of the that makes it not so nice for our participants because we actually. So first of all, like for these freely moving studies, um, we need to really have a good coverage. So it's if you look at a room like this, you have to walk around quite a bit to have like a good coverage of the room, and you have basically sampled every location in the room multiple times. Um, and that's true for all um, for all the, the data that we have. Yes, we definitely look at repetitions um, of the same event or of the same location or whatever we look at. Um, definitely. I, I will say that one thing. So I I have my background is um, with fMRI. Um, and so I was looking at similar things, like, for example, this grid cell um, pattern. You can look at it also in fMRI, grid cell population activity. Um, one thing that I found really exciting when I started to work with intracranial, like real world um, data is, um, and again, this is anecdotally, I didn't systematically compare, but um, the effects are much, much stronger with much less repetitions um, if you're doing something in the real world, physically walking around as compared to if you are in the fMRI scanner and you do it um, with virtual reality. Um, I don't know if that's, you know, like that can have many reasons. It can be real world uh, making the difference. It can be physical movement making the difference. It can be the imaging modality like electrophysiology versus like fMRI bowl signal. We don't know that. Um, but for me, it was actually really nice to work with that data from freely moving people in the real world because we needed much less repetitions to get like strong effects as what I showed, for example, before, um, like the single channel um, example where we see this grid cell pattern in one person, one recording channel. This is something that I it doesn't look that beautiful when I average over 25 people in fMRI. So that just it's just um, we need less repetitions um, to get really, really strong signals. And part of this is hopefully or maybe also the fact that it's just real world and it's just a very immersive experience if you are in real world, right? There's an online question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, well, I was going to ask about the Something to do with the beta oscillations. Yeah. Um, you said that they were stronger along the boundaries of the ring. Yeah. But what if like more people were introduced, um, or like people the people that were walking were interrupted. Uh -huh. So like um somebody like interrupted them while they were walking. Do you think there'd be like a difference in their oscillation, their beta oscillations? Or 
Yeah, I, so this is a great question. And um, I can tell you what I think. Um, so basically speculation, but so all the data that I've seen so far, um, and we, we've run similar studies, which are not published or not even completely analyzed, but all the data that I've seen so far makes me really believe that it's not so much related to, you know, like a specific, um, for example, environmental feature. So I don't think this is actually a signal that encodes like boundaries of the room or something like that. What I think it is showing is um, that theta oscillations in a way um, represent something that is relevant to us at a point in time. So to your question, I think if you um, if you do something during um, the task that um, might cause like a shift uh, of attention of this person or something else is relevant or they focus like the participants focus on a different thing in the environment or the, another person that is introduced or interrupting them or something like that i think what we would see is also a change in representation where all of a sudden if the boundaries of the room are not as relevant at a point in time you would see a switch and this is actually also something that that we see for example when um you have to keep track of where you are and you use the boundaries of the room to keep track of where you are because this is like your salient um kind of location information like your coordinate system that that you see um but then we see these boundary representations but if you focus on something else um like for example um i don't know you don't want to bump into something or so you might see a much stronger representation of self motion information like movement speed or these kinds of things so we see that so again i we didn't test exactly what you were asking but my best guess is that you would just switch to a different representation depending on what is currently relevant right does this answer um so matthew nelson said great talk the explanation is very clear one thing i might have missed how do you download the data from the neural case and how much data in terms of file size and recording can it store at one time um okay so how do we download the data so there are different ways so we have worked with this over the last couple of years and made all of this possible but um it's a little complicated because there are different models of these uh of these um implanted devices and it really depends on the specific model um but um one way and that worked really well with an older like older it's still implanted in brains but um with an older model um is we can really stream it directly to a laptop so our participants like basically have um like we have a recording wand that uh, wirelessly um, gets the data out of the system through near field communication and that streams the data to a laptop that the participant is carrying in a backpack. So immediately after the recording or even in real time, we could work with that data. Um, other models do not allow us to get direct access. I think this is also um, something to do with company policies and, and, and whatever. But um, so there we stream the data. And so um, Usually these devices only store locally like a small amount of data, um, but um, that's something that we've developed over the last couple of years where um, we basically send a mark um, to the signal so that it stores it to a cloud. And there, um, I don't think there are any limitations. So basically, you can record endlessly, and then um, we just need to get access to that cloud, which works through collaboration with uh, with Neuropace, who is the company who develops these systems. Um, and so you can um, get all the data. There is a limitation, though, um, and this is you can't or you don't want to record like, I don't know, three days continuously because also um, these continuous recordings drain battery and every battery replacement means a surgery for the patient. This is not like it's not something where they have to, I don't know, get a battery replacement three days after they participated in a study. But, you know, like in the long term, um, you don't want to um, drain that battery more than necessary, even though it's just a, a tiny little bit. In terms of file size, I don't know. I mean, it's not like huge files, but I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, it depends on the on the data amount, but say for two hour recordings, maybe I, I, I honestly don't know. It's it's not that many recording channels, so it's not huge files. It's it's easy to work with. Well, thank David, the last, the last question. Yeah, uh, lovely talk and fascinating work. Really exciting potential here. Thank um, you. Since you've sort of invited collaborators, potential collaborators at the end, could you sort of talk about 
what sort of collaborations might be a good fit for you and some of the limitations. I would imagine these surgical patients are really precious and the electro the recordings are only in certain places in the brain and things like that, but, but open ended question yeah um i mean it's also a big question i'm so i personally uh, this is not the only line of research that i want to pursue this is the focus of the talk and this was a big part of my postdoc work but i definitely um want to work on kind of all kinds of experiments with multiple uh, or multimodal neuroimaging. So definitely also want to do a non-invasive neuroimaging. I will and want to use fMRI, which again is was my background, and I did this over basically my whole PhD, and even before. Um, uh, also, non-invasive neuroimaging, like with um, FNIRS going out in the real world, freely moving um, studies um, with people who have no implanted electrodes, right? Um, so all these kind of things, I'm personally really interested in like um, this intersection of navigation and memory, um, but also this can be, you know, like on a really, really broad scale, like, okay, how do we remember like an everyday life experience or how do we find our way from a to b or from this building to that building or it can go all the way to how do we process sensory information to um kind of to um keep track of where we are or, or these kind of things so it's it's just really broad and i don't think um i i don't think um i want to or will have like a narrow focus um in terms of these people with implanted electrodes um it really so um it hippocampus, anterior cortex, medial temporal lobe happen to be brain regions where um, these devices are implanted relatively often or the electrodes um, because these are, I would say, not typical, but like a little bit more common seizure onset zone. So obviously you want to implant these electrodes in regions where um, the seizure is originating from. Um, so it's it was for us, obviously, a good situation that we can get access to people who have electrodes exactly at these regions that are really relevant for memory, for navigation. Um, but there are um, patients with electrodes in all kinds of brain regions. This is really an individual thing. Not everybody has the electrode in the hippocampus, right? Um, it's just this is what we were looking at so far. I know that, um, so I've been talking with actually like many, uh, several um, neurosurgeons and clinical teams in the Boston area, because this is something for me important to find out, um, happened to be like a really beautifully big um, group of people who have um, these devices implanted in the thalamus, which is, um, I think, a great opportunity. There are obviously lots of interesting things um, happening that we can look at. And again, in terms of spatial navigation, memory, but also like I'm interested basically in uh, real world, everyday life, human behavior. Like I find all of that exciting and um, would be interested in collaborations in, on different topics. I don't, that was a very broad answer. I don't know if it's... We'll let other folks come up and chat with you, but we'll let folks go. Thank you so much. This is fascinating. Thank you.